Our call to worship is Isaiah 43. But now, this is what the Lord says. He who created you, Jacob, he who formed you, Israel, do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have summoned you by name, you are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. When you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. I give Egypt for your ransom, Cush and Seba in your st stead. Since you are precious and honored in my sight, and because I love you, I will give people in exchange for you, nations in exchange for your life. Do not be afraid, for I am with you. I will bring your children from the east and gather you from the west. I will say to the north, give them up, and to the south, do not hold them back. Bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the ends of the earth. Everyone who is called by my name, whom I created for my glory, whom I formed and made. Lead out those who have eyes but are blind, who have ears but are deaf. All the nations gather together and the peoples assemble. Which of their gods foretold this? and proclaim to us the former things? Let them bring in their witnesses to prove they were right, so that others may hear and say, it is true. You are my witnesses, declares the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, so that you may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me, no God was formed nor will there be one after me. I, even I, am the Lord. Apart from me there is no Savior. I have revealed and saved and proclaimed. I, and not some foreign God among you, you are my witnesses, declares the Lord, that I am God. Yes, and from ancient days I am He, no one can deliver out of my hand. When I act, who can reverse it? Amen. Join me as we sing our opening song this morning. It will be, We Gather Together, on page 387. Praise, O oh Lord, make us free. 
Good morning, brothers and sisters. Good day. This is our Sunday, April 26th service, service and it is so good to be here this morning. So, uh, together, online, this is recorded the day before, but it's, it's uh, difficult to keep all that together, especially nowadays as we shelter in place. So this morning, may God be glorified as we worship together, as we sing praises to his name. Hopefully we just got done with our online chat session through the Zoom meeting and that we all had the opportunity just to share with one another, to lift up our praises and our prayer requests. But this morning, may God be glorified at your own home. May you lift up your voices and praise him as we continue to sing this morning. And please bow with me as we open with prayer. <clears throat> Lord, I thank you so much for this day. I thank you, Lord, that we have this opportunity to come into each other's and into your presence through your spirit, though we may be separated by distance, may, may we, though we may be separated from each other as we're in each, of, we're in each of our own homes. Lord, we just ask this morning that you'll be glorified. Help us as we, this morning, lift our voices to you. Help us to, to focus on who you are and what you've done because you are worthy, Lord, you are the God that created the heavens and the earth. You are the God that deserves our glory and our worship. And so this morning, as we worship you, may you fill our hearts again with your spirit. Renew it in us so that we can continue this week as your children. Help us to serve you in whatever capacity you call us. And in all things, Lord, again, may you be glorified. We set this time aside for you this morning, Lord, and it's in your name we pray. Amen. All right. Good morning. And so we're going to continue this morning with our song service. Our next song will be Jesus Loves Me on page 226 of our hymnals. snow on page 109 wider than snow jesus does love us and he saved us he is our savior he is our rock he is our fortress he makes us wider than snow
What a wonderful song. Our next song is Sweet Hour of Prayer, page 439, Sweet Hour of Prayer. And this will be a prayer hymn. Let's go ahead and sing. <clears throat> Lord Jesus, I thank you so much for this day and for this opportunity we have to lift our voices and just praise you. And Lord, you are our God. You're the God that created us, the God that sustains us, the God that loves us. And so this morning, as we continue to sing to you, may you be glorified. Help us, Lord, as we lift our voices, that we focus on you, that our hearts are t tuned to you, and that in all things that we might be yours. Help us to continue to do this until you call us home. Help us to be your servants about your business and the world around us. We thank you so much for this day, Lord, and it's in your name we pray. Amen. Our communion hymn this morning is going to be Break Thou the Bread of Life. And after um, we sing the communion hymn, you will... Uh, Hopefully, you will have your communion items together. Um, if you have the pre-packaged things, make sure you have those ready. After communion, I will pray, and then we will have a, a song in the background as we all take communion. Oh, after the communion hymn, we will have Mr. Hart do the communion meditation. And then I will pray, and we will have a song in the background while um, we all take our, our, our communion. Um, so let's uh, prepare for that. Break Thou the Bread of Life, page 30. Ta 
touch my eyes and make me see. Show me the truth concealed within my word. For in thy book revealed I see thee, Lord. Amen. Okay, now we'll have Mr. Hart uh, lead us in a communion. Imagine what it felt like to be in Job's shoes. Warriors, fire, and wind wiped out his fortune and killed his children. When his body was so covered with boils that he scratched at his inflamed skin with broken pottery. Had Job not believed in the Lord's faithfulness, he probably would have taken his wife's advice and just curse God and die. Job was brought low, and he didn't know why, nor did he ever find out the reason. Thanks to Scripture, we are privy to the conversation between God and Satan, but the Lord didn't share those details with, with Job. Left in the dark, he had to decide if his faith in God's goodness would stand. Job decided to trust God in the midst of tragedy. He could have railed against God, as his wife suggested, or he might have followed his friend's advice and racked his brain for some unconfessed sin. But neither of these actions would have been fruitful. Instead, Job chose to view everything as a part of the divine plan acknowledging the Lord's right to do whatever he wanted for the glory of his name. Accepting the good that God sends our way is easy. Our challenge is to receive tragedy with a willing attitude and a teachable spirit. Change is part of the equation. Nothing comes into our life except through the Lord's permission. So during this COVID-19, just trust in the Lord. He has a plan. Thank you. Let's go ahead and pray. Lord, as we gather around uh, these elements uh, that represent your blood and your body that you sacrificed on the cross, we come before you now humbly and recognize that you did what we could not do that you gave your body freely, your life freely, and that you're, you were sinless. You paid the price that, that, was, that should be demanded of us because of our guilt, because of our shame, and yet you took it upon your back. And Lord, this morning, as we partake of this bread and this juice that represents your body and your blood, sacrificed on the cross for the redemption of our sins. We celebrate that, Lord. We commune with you. We unite with you, and we thank you for that. And as you rose on the third day, the first of many, we look forward to that one day where we will stand before you face to face when we're absent from our body, but yet present with you until the day that you give us new bodies. Until then, Lord, may you be glorified, and thank you for this opportunity. It's in your name we pray. Amen. All right, good morning. Again, this is our Sunday, April 26th service, and I welcome everyone that's able to join us today online and those, my family, that are here with us in the church building. And today, I just want to say, you know, it's been a long time since we met together, and I'm really looking forward to when we can come back into each other's presence. But I was, I was at this store yesterday, and one of the clerks told me that I believe that she said the governor of Illinois extended the shelter in place through May. 
So I don't, I haven't looked it up, but if that's true, it sounds like they're really trying to extend this. So hopefully there's good reasons for that, but if not, let's start petitioning and make our voices be heard that we want to come back together. Until then, we're going to go ahead and meet this way. This morning, I want to start a new series of, 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 of sermons that kind of focus on different characters in the Bible and what we can learn from them and characters that teach us something based on where we're at right now. You know, we're, we're in this pandemic, we're in this uh, coronavirus time, we're separated. And so there's things that we can learn. Um, I know that I was preaching through the books of the Bible as we, you know, just kind of given an introduction, but it seemed like there was just a lot more relevant messages, so we kind of abandoned that. But we are still reading through the Bible. So if you're following along with us and reading through the New Testament in a chronological order, you should have went through Joshua, Judges, and Ruth by now. We're First Samuel, we're in Second Samuel, and some Psalms. And so hopefully you're keeping up with that and and, and enjoying just all this different history that God has provided for us. Now today. It's called make, He Makes All Things New. He Makes All Things New. And so I would like to go to the next slide. I have some slides down here, and um, they're going to turn that towards me a little more. But He Makes All Things New. And so basically, God gives us all sorts of examples throughout scriptures of, of people so that we can learn more about him and more about how we are to act. And sometimes the people he gives us example as examples are, are untidy or, the, or, or they have untidy circumstances. You see, the world is a dark place. The world is filled with sin and trouble. And the Bible shows us that God enters that dark place. God enters at the darkest situations in order to bring redemption. And amen to that. Isn't that amen? Amen. Amen. He comes and offers us the opportunity then to be his agents of change in the world. We get to partner with him. He tells us that he planned good works for us to accomplish before the creation of the world. So amen to that. We can partner with him even though we may have had untidy situations because he brings redemptions. Today, our text is Joshua 2, one, um, the whole chapter of, of 2, and we're going to take a look at past sins, forgiveness, and reputations. You see, despite having bad reputations, God can use us to do significant good things. He can do significant things with our life and our legacy, even if we've had a bad reputation in the past. Now, a good reputation is obviously what we want. We strive for a good reputation, but we all have sinned. We all have fallen short of the glory of God, and no matter how we've conducted ourselves in the past, it does not determine how we move forward. We still may be constrained by past sins, but it does not have to define who we are as we move forward. And so today we're going to read Joshua chapter 2. Go to the next one. Oh, so before we read Joshua chapter 2, so um, Joshua chapter 2 tells us about a character um, that, that, you know, in our Sunday school classes, we've often heard of different characters. Uh, different Bible stories, and we've heard of great Bible stories. So if you grew up in a time where we had Sunday school and you went to Sunday school or vacation Bible school, you probably heard all the, all the traditional stories of Moses as he, you know, he was a baby and put into a basket and, and how God saved him through that or how, how Moses led the people out of Egypt. Or about David, the young shepherd who killed lion and, and bear and then went and fought the dreaded Philistine, Goliath. Uh, another great story. Or about Joseph, the young dreamer who, who had the amazing multicolored coat and he became 
Pharaoh's second man, um, or of course, any of the 12 disciples, the stories of Jesus. These were common stories, but the Bible's also filled with lesser known stories. Sometimes these stories are very short, and sometimes these stories are not very tidy. And so they're, they're not often the ones told in Bible, in, in, in like your Bible schools. But today, we, we're going to look at one of those because you can learn an awful lot about God's grace from all these stories. Um, and unfortunately, some of these don't get much attention. Um, but this one today is of Rahab. Um, so Rahab lived in the land of Canaan. She was in the city of Jericho. And in Joshua 2, we read about how the children of Israel are about ready to move into the promised land. They're about ready to take possession of the land that God had promised to them. And they're, on, they're across the Jordan, and Joshua decides to send two spies into the land of the, the, the promised land to spy out the area, to see how they might conquer it, and especially the city of Jericho. And so the two spies cross the Jordan and they spy out the land and they come to Jericho and they go, they meet up with a woman called Rahab. And she has a house that, that is in the wall and she um, talks to the two spies and lets them in. But Rahab has a reputation. Actually, scripture says that Rahab was a prostitute and that she had her, had her house in the wall, and that was a good place for her to meet, meet people as they came and, and went. And so let's read Joshua 2 and, and hear, the, hear what Scripture says about the story. Then Joshua, son of Nun, secretly sent two spies from Shedem to, and said, Go look over the land, especially Jericho. So they went and entered the house of a prostitute named Rahab and stayed there. The king of Jericho was told, look, some of the Israelites have come here tonight to spy out the land. So the king of Jericho sent this message to Rahab. Bring out the men who came to you and entered your house because they have come to spy out the whole land. But the woman had taken the two men and hidden them. And she said, yes, the men came to me, but I did not know where they had come from. At dusk, when it was time to close the city gate, they left. I don't know which way they went. Go after them quickly. You may catch up with them. But she had taken them up to the roof and had hidden them under some stalks of flax that she had laid out on the roof. So the men set out in pursuit of the spies on the road that leads to the fords of the Jordan. As soon as the pursuers had gone out, the gate was shut. Before the spies lay down for the night, Rahab went up to the roof and said to them, I know that the Lord has given you this land and that a great fear of you has fallen on us so that all who live in this country are melting in fear because of you. We have heard how the Lord dried up the waters of the Red Sea for you when you came out of Egypt and what you did to Sihon and Og the two kings of the Amorites east of the Jordan, whom you completely destroyed. When we heard of it, our hearts melted in fear, and everyone's courage failed because of you. For the Lord your God is God in heaven above and on the earth below. Now then, please swear to me by the Lord that you will show kindness to my family, because I have shown kindness to you. Give me a sure sign that you will spare the lives of my father and mother, my brothers and sisters, and all who belong to them, and that you will save us from death. Our lives for your lives, the men assured her. If you don't tell what we are doing, we will treat you kindly and faithfully when the Lord gives us the land. So she let them down by a rope through the window, for the house she lived in was part of the city wall. And she said to them, Go to the hills, so the pursuers will not find you. Hide yourselves there three days until they return, and then go on your way. Now the men had said to her, This oath you made us swear will not be binding on us, unless when we enter the land, you have tied this scarlet cord in the window through which you let us down. And unless you have brought your father, 
and mother and brothers and all your family into your house. If any of them go outside your house into the street, their blood will be on their own heads. We will not be responsible. As for those who are in your house with you, their blood will be on our head if a hand is laid on them. But if you tell what we are doing, we will be released from the oath we made you swear. You made us swear. Agreed, she replied. Let it be as you said. So she sent them away, and they departed, and she tied the scarlet cord in the window. When they left, they went into the hills and stayed there three days until the pursuers had searched all along the road and returned without finding them. Then the two men started back. They went down out of the hills, forded the river, and came to Joshua, son of Nun, and told him everything that had happened to them. They said to Joshua, The Lord has surely given the whole land into our hands. All the people are melting in fear because of us. Amen. So, all the people melting in fear because of us. Reputations are important. They're especially important for God's people. God's people. Proverbs 22, 1 says, A good name is more desirable than great riches. To be esteemed is better than silver and gold. A good name is more desirable than, than great riches. Scripture reminds us of the value of a, of a good reputation. It's, it's our character before mankind. And and. When we have a good reputation, it can open doors for us. But more importantly, our word is taken to be true. Okay? A bad reputation, on the other hand, can, can harm you. And it's hard for us to recover, for someone to recover from a bad reputation. So starting out with a good reputation is good. Um, but the good news about Rahab's story is here is someone who has a reputation of a prostitute. And that's not a good reputation, although they, they existed at the time. She was known as a prostitute. The king of the city of Jericho knew who she was, knew her as a prostitute. And so she had this reputation, but as we, as we will see later on in the story, we won't read it, but that reputation can be changed. So if she had this reputation, the question is, why would these two spies go to Rahab? Why wouldn't they find someone more reputable to go to than to ask for help? Okay, someone less controversial, maybe. Well, we don't really know why they went to Rahab. This, the scripture doesn't tell us why they chose Rahab out of, out of any other resident in the city, except possibly... Possibly that they were spying out the land, right? And as they were spying out the land, they didn't want to draw attention to themselves. So they wanted to blend in. And by going to Rahab's house, they could, pro they could make pe people think that they were just regular travelers traveling on the road. And, and they passed by Jericho. And they just stopped by Rahab's house, as was a regular traveler's habit of, of men in those days. Um, they knew a woman like Rahab would know the city well and that she would be able to provide them with information, valuable information. And it, since they probably knew her reputation, they knew she did things that she shouldn't do for money. And if worse came to worse, they might be able to buy some information from her. This might be why they went to Rahab, but certainly one of the main reasons they went to Rahab is because God is God. And God allowed this woman to, 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 be, to show Israel that God can change reputations. Okay? He used her. He planned her involvement in, in this. Rahab not only allowed the spies in, she helped them in a couple different ways. Number one, she first hid them and protected them when the men of Jericho were looking for them, right? They came to her house. She had hid them from them. And that was, that was certainly at no little cost to her or risk to her. She risked a lot by hiding them. Because the king knew they were spies. 
and she was hiding these spies. If she were caught hiding them, it would not go well with her. But the second way she helped them is that she sent the men of Jericho in a different direction looking for the spies. So she not only hid them, <clears throat> but she ensured the success of their, of their mission by ensuring that the men of Jericho went a different direction. Now, at this point, I'm just going to go off on a little segue because we're talking about changed reputations and how God can change our reputations. But I want to go on a segue about did Rahab lie? We just read the text, and obviously it's not the Hebrew, but it's the English. But did, did Rahab lie? And is lying, is it ever right to lie? These are questions that people have been talking about since this story has come about. And people want to know, did Rahab lie? Is it okay to lie sometimes? Well, usually it's just adults that get bogged down with these questions because, you know, most, most children, I have some children here. Children, is it ever right to lie? I need to hear voices. No. No, it's never right to lie. Lie is wrong, right? So the question is, <clears throat> did Rahab lie? So here we go. The Bible nowhere presents an instance where lying is considered to be the right thing to do. God hates lying. The ninth commandment prohibits bearing false witness, right? Proverbs 6, 19. Or 16 through 19 says a lying tongue and a false witness who pours out lies as listed as two of the seven abominations to the Lord. A false witness and a tongue that pours out lies. God hates lies. Liars will be cast into the eternal fires. And yet we read the opposite. Uh, we read about love. And love rejoices with the truth. That's in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 6. Love rejoices in the truth. We are given the spirit of truth. Other scriptures that speak negatively of lying are in the Psalms, Proverbs, Ephesians, Colossians, Revelation. All throughout the Bible, we see lying is wrong. Okay? There are many examples of liars in the scriptures, from the deceit of Jacob in Genesis 27 to Ananias and Sapphira in Acts 5, when, when they lie about the, how much they sold the field for. And remember what happened to them. They, were, they instantly dropped dead um, individually as they both committed a lie. <clears throat> time after time, we see that falsehoods in the scriptures leads to misery it leads to loss, and it leads to judgment, okay? Lying is never presented as a good thing or a right thing in scriptures. But there are at least two instances in scriptures where apparent lying produced a favorable, favorable result. One of them is when the Hebrew midwives were told to kill all the male babies that, they, that, were, that were born and they didn't. And when they told Pharaoh what was going on, uh, they told Pharaoh that the Hebrew women were uh, st sturdy, resilient women. I forget the words they use, but that they often gave birth before the midwives arrived. And, and so it sounds like they had deceived Pharaoh. And the second example of a, maybe of a parent lying um, not only did it sound like they deceived Pharaoh, but it produced favorable results, okay? Um, they, they had the Lord's blessing upon them for not killing the Hebrew babies, and it probably saved many Hebrew babies' lives. Um, but another example, the second example, is Rahab. Rahab actions to protect the Israelite spies in Joshua 2. So our text leads us to focus. As we look at the text, our text is not really covering whether it's right to lie in certain circumstances or not. That's not the focus of this text. In fact, if you read this text, it's very clear that the author, Joshua, or, or, or Joshua tried to focus our attention not on a falsehood, but rather on the truth that she confessed. Okay? So, um, 
the truth that she confessed is, is what she is, is what he kind of focused on as you read through there that the this exchange with the guards is, is very sharp the text conceals her motives for, for why she um, did what she did with the guards I mean we don't really know her true motives if she was trying to protect the Israelites because they were uh, in, in need or if she was looking just to save her own skin but because her motives are 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 kind of hidden but we we do know that her motives are out of faith that she declares her faith in the Lord okay uh, the rest of scripture as we look as the rest of scripture remembers Rahab it doesn't mention anything about deception or possible deception but what it remembers is that she was a woman who stepped out in faith faith in the Lord Hebrews eleven thirty one and James two twenty five both commend her because of her faith which resulted in her actions with the spies and the, and the town's authorities and it's a strong possibility that she did not lie but used words to protect the Israelites so if I go to Hebrews eleven thirty one on the screen it says by faith prostitute Rahab because she welcomed the spies was not killed with those who were disobedient and then James 2 25 says in the same way not even was not even Rahab the prostitute considered righteous for what she did when she gave lodging to the spies and sent them off in a different direction as the body without the spirit is dead so faith without without deeds is dead two examples in scripture where it records that what Rahab did was an excellent thing in the eyes of the Lord now it doesn't address whether or not she used deception or lied but we know that the Lord hates liars but we also know that the Lord cares for those in needs if you look at the on the screen our God cares for those in needs and Job uh, 5 15 and 16 it says he saves the needy from the sword from the sword uh, in their mouth he saves them from the clutches of the powerful so the poor have hope and injustice shuts its mouth or again in Psalm 20, or 82 verse 3 it says defend the weak and the fatherless uphold the cause of the poor and the oppressed okay God cares about the weak and the oppressed and he wants us to care about the weak and the oppressed we are called to do likewise Proverbs 31 8 and 9 says speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves for the rights of all who are destitute speak up and judge fairly defend the rights of the poor and, and the needy Rahab could have been doing that Proverbs 29 7 the righteous care about justice for the poor but the wicked have no such concern and then James 1 I hope you all know this religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless as this to look at orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world we are called to do likewise God cares about the needy, about the weak, about the downtrodden, and he cares about the poor, and he asks us to do likewise. So, so Rahab, I, as I look at it, I do not believe Rahab lied. I think scripture it clearly says her actions were glorified the Lord. It's quite possible that if, if we call it a lie, that she used as a new Christian or as a new believer convert in God you know she believed in God she trusted in him that she wanted to glorify him and you know, she glorified him by, by using the only thing she knew how which was from her old life the ends justify the means and so perhaps she used the faulty ends justified the means but she did it out of faith and that faith was pleasing to God um, it, whatever the case is Rahab's reputation began to change by believing in the God of Israel in verses 8 through 11 uh, she tells the spies that she heard 
all about the Israelites and all that God had done. And that's an amazing thing. I mean, it's not like they had the 24-7 news cycles blasting constantly, and yet they knew what God had done. And not only that, she declared that the God of Israel, that their God was the only God, was her God. She accepted God. She was a convert and a convert. In 1 Peter 2.12, it says, Dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles to abstain from sinful desires which wage war against your soul. Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. A good reputation. Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human authority, whether to the emperor as a supreme authority, or to the governors who are sent by him to punish those who do wrong and to commend those who do right. Ray, sorry, for it is God's will that by doing good, you should silence the ignorant talk of foolish people. Live as free people, but do not use your freedom as a cover-up for evil. Live as God's slave. slaves. Show proper respect to everyone. Love the family of believers. Fear God in honor of the emperor. Rahab's reputation began to change because she loved the Lord. And as we look at that first, that Peter verse there, we need to have a good reputation. We need to live lives that honor and submit to the rulers and the authorities that God has put over us so that we, our words, will be accepted. That's, that's what God desires of us. But we do it not so that we can please man. We do it so that we can please God because we care not whether we're found pleasing to man as long as we're desiring to please God and we have a good reputation. Okay? So Rahab's reputation began to change and she asks to be saved from destruction. Right? And the spies agree to help her if she hangs a scarlet a scarlet cord outside of her window. Now, the red scarf is kind of similar to Israel when they left Egypt and they had to place the blood over the, over the doorpost. And as they did that, the night that they, the next day they were leaving, the angel of death that would go into Egypt and kill the firstborn child would pass over their doors, their household, if their doorpost had the blood of the lamb on it. And so Rahab was rescued by having the scarlet cord, which kind of represents that same covering that the Israelites had um, in Passover. And so she was rescued. And not only did her life get spared, not only did the lives of her family get spared, but Rahab was rescued and she lived among the Jews from that point forward. Um, and we see that in Joshua. And she eventually married a man named Salmon. And Salmon and her had a baby. And his name was Boaz. Right? And Boaz, well, had, had children. But you remember Ruth and Boaz. We just read that. But she is a great-grandmother of King David and is an ancestor of Jesus. Rahab's reputation had changed and from being known as a prostitute from being in the family line of Jesus. That's an amazing thing. God changes reputations. Now, you know, it's kind of interesting because she went from being what she was to being in Jesus' line of ancestry. It's kind of interesting if you ever used Ancestry.com or anything to look up your own ancestry, perhaps you found some interesting thing. There's a blog out there from one of the, from the Ancestry.com, and it talks about three uh, crazy things real people have found in their family history, and it talks about um, them finding things. One person discovered that they had a witch in their ancestry. Another person discovered that they were related to, roi re related to royalty. But Rahab became royalty because she honored God. God changed her reputation. So, 
God is in, in, is in the business of changing reputations. Regardless of how we start, regardless of where we are right now, God can change our reputation. God can use us, and our past does not have to dictate our future. The way we've acted and have been in the past is the past. Today is a new day, and it's a day that the Lord has made, and it's a day that we can rejoice and glorify him, and we can step out today as his servants, as his hands and feet, and show his love and mercy to the world around us. Our past does not dictate our future. God has done it. He has set us free. And so we can glorify him with our life. Ours may not be like, our life may not be like Rahab's life, but she is an example that no matter what we've done in our life, if we believe and repent, God loves us so much that he can use us in ways that we cannot even imagine. Amen? Amen. 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 We're going to close with a song, Onward Christian Soldiers. But before we do that, I just want to encourage you, do not let your past dictate your future. We can finish the race and we can finish it strong because that's what God desires of us. And we can do that with God's help. Let's sing Onward Christian Soldier on page 617.
Praise the Lord. Well, I thank you so much for being part of the service this morning. I thank everyone here uh, for singing out loud and praising the Lord. And I hope that his words have spoken to you and you realize that you are free to go forward to worship him and to be his hands and feet. Let's go ahead and have a, a blessing to close us with. Let's pray. Lord, this morning, I just ask that your blessing will be upon every person that's watching this now, that you will glorify yourself through them, that you will strengthen them and give them the courage as you gave Joshua. You told him to be courageous and strong and to go forth and to accomplish the work that you have set out for him. Lord, I pray that your hand of blessing will be upon each person, that you will make them courageous and strong, that each of us can be your servants in the world around us, that we can show your love and mercy and not fear and not be afraid, not curl up, but to go forth as your army. Lord, we also pray that you will open the world our, our world around us up again that you will move our governor's heart that you will have him see the virus for what it is and allow us to get back to life to where we can be in each other's presence that we can encourage one another that we can give each other a holy kiss lord it's in your name we pray amen thank you very much <laughs>